Refugees, are they welcome or not? How wide should Canada open its doors? That's next. Well, we are witnessing the largest refugee crisis since World War II. And the focus now is on Syria, but the full story is bigger. To fill us in, the UN's top representative in Canada on these issues joins us from Ottawa. Mr. Furio D'Angelis, welcome to Context. Thank you for having me on your program. Okay, help us first, why is the number so high? Well, it's true. Uh, we are really facing a, a major war crisis. There are, at the moment, more than 60 million people who are displaced by war, persecution, violation of human rights. There are 60 million uh, persons who are really a large, large number. If this were a, a country, we would have the 24th nation in the world. So this is really a, a, a momentous, uh, a terrible moment for uh, humanity because uh, these are people who are victims uh, of war, of conflicts, uh, of persecution, of violation of human rights. We don't like to think the world is that fragile in war, but it really is. Um, it, it, this is the effects of war, correct? Well, I mean, uh, uh, taking only the Syrian example, we have now a conflict in Syria which has been going on for the last uh, five years. We are entering the fifth year. We have more than four million uh, Syrian refugees uh, in the region. And now we are, we, of course, we are seeing a spilling over uh, to larger regions. Uh, we have uh, 500, more than 500,000 arriving in Europe. Uh, but this is not surprise. I mean, the, the humanitarian programs have been underfunded. Uh, if you think that the entire humanitarian programs for Syrian refugees in the region is funded only a 41% of its needs, then uh, you will see that it's not surprising that people are just trying to find a place where to take their families and live a normal life. And unfortunately, they don't have any other solutions that taking these very dangerous journeys and paying criminal networks and sometimes risking their lives. More than 3,000 people have been killed uh, on the way to, to Europe uh, only this year. Is the Canadian response to this crisis adequate? We, we have seen in the, in the recent weeks an outpouring of, of sympathy and support with a lot of local communities and municipalities getting together and trying to provide uh, 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 assistance in terms of uh, sponsoring for uh, Syrian refugees. This is very important that is happening. But of course, uh, look at the situation in the world. We want countries to do more, all countries but, but in the world, including about, Canada. Let's talk back about Canada, because we have wondered why is it taking so long, the, the controversy we've had over screening. Um, is our immigration department doing enough? Well, I mean, as, as I was saying, all countries have to do more. All important countries so especially to have do to more. do more. So of course Canada has to do more together with all other countries. The response to the, to the humanitarian crisis of the Syrian situation and the other crises in the world is not adequate, of course. We are having, a, otherwise we wouldn't have 60 million persons victims of humanitarian crises around the world. We need political solutions. Uh, we need countries to come together, important countries come together to find political solutions, and the same countries and public at large get together, give contributions, and uh, providing uh, uh, resettlement places for Syrian refugees. This is absolutely important that happens. And tell us how we need to um, think about those who are outside the media spotlight. You mentioned Syria, it's all the talk. Um, but, but how much broader do we need to be thinking on, on refugee care? Well, absolutely. You see, if you think that in the last five years uh, there have been uh, 15 uh, uh, conflicts uh, which have broken out or have reignited. Uh, more than a million persons are displaced uh, out of Yemen uh, and uh, the, the crisis in, in Ukraine and the Central African Republic. Uh, and there are so many other different spots in the, in the world which are now suffering uh, with respect to humanitarian crisis and displacement. Uh, 
uh, of course, uh, the, the, the first reaction should be contribution. And we, we are seeing an increasing level of contribution coming from the Canadian public, for which we are extremely appreciative. It's enough to go to our webpage, UNHCR Canada, and, and provide contributions, because unfortunately, the funding level for the humanitarian crisis is much, much too low compared to its needs. Okay, we have got your website, and, and um, you, you do make a very clear um, breakout there of the refugee populations needing help. You know, Canada had a special um, pause when uh, little Alan Curdy's body came into all of our view. What did you think as the UNHCR expert on this when you saw that picture and the, and the reaction to it? Of course, that, that picture was, was dramatic. Uh, there are difficult words to find uh, to describe that picture. That, that has been, but it's the symbol. I mean, b behind that picture, there are other millions of people who are suffering. Uh, and, and that was particularly dramatic because of the event, because of the child. But that, that, that also shown that people are able to react. The, there is the compassion to react. And, and that was maybe a turning point. Uh, people got aware that there is a, it's important to bring your own bucket of water to try extinguishing this world fire of humanitarian crisis, of, of refugee needs. Uh, and uh, it's important that everybody really feels committed to it. And let's talk long term, preventing this kind of refugee crisis from continuing. What needs to happen? Well, as I was saying, there is no humanitarian solution to humanitarian crisis. There are only political solutions to humanitarian crisis. This is important. For a political solution, we need the honest brokers, and also we need the political will of influential countries in the region and influential countries globally to come together and find political solutions. Too many conflicts have been going on too long. If you only think of Afghanistan, of Somalia, these are conflicts which have been there now for more than 20 years, and Afghanistan more than 30 years. And so it's, it's, it's really too long for a conflict to go on. It's important that countries who have an influence on the people who are fighting come together, bring their influence, and find a political solution. All countries uh, who, who have something to say in that respect should be committed to, this, uh, to achieve this. Well, you know, the sponsor who inspired this program said this a long time ago, blessed are the peacemakers. Thank you for being one of those. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you so much for having me on this program. Furio De Angelis, the UNHCR representative to Canada, thank you very much. Thank you. Our next two guests have been featured in national media on many occasions during this crisis. Lean al Zaibak founded an organization, Jusur, to provide education to Syrian refugees. She is on the steering committee for Lifeline Syria. And Ron Aki, former MP and immigration minister under Joe Clark, oversaw the program which brought Vietnamese refugees to Canada. He is now a security law expert. Let's welcome them both to Context. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's been an amazing discussion because Canadians are remembering. We had the unprecedented honour of winning the Nansen Medal for what happened when we brought the Vietnamese refugees to Canada. And Ron, this, that, was your, that was your file. Uh, I was lucky because <laughs> I arrived at the right place and I was in the right time to be able to do something with the change of government. Uh, the mechanics for the refugee movement were, was in place, um, were in place for three or four years before I got there, but the numbers were fairly low. Uh, the then Trudeau government w had committed to 10,000 uh, Vietnamese, uh, 5,000 and up to 10,000. We came in and said, well, we can do better than that. And so we increased it first to 12,000 and then up to 50,000. So I was going to ask you, what did we do then that we're not doing now? So it's interesting because the numbers were the same on the starting block, 10 and 10. What else did we do different, then? Different that... times, different place. Uh, first of all, this crisis is, is a much more serious refugee crisis world, worldwide, as your representative from the UNHCR said. Um, secondly, the attitudes of the Canadian public are slightly different now. 
Um, how? Let's talk about how are our attitudes different? Um, I think there is more of a security concern um, as a result of e events, both last October uh, in our own jurisdiction, uh, shootings, homegrown terrorists in the United States, in Europe, in Norway, in places like that. The impact of 9-11 is not over yet. Okay, Lean, help us understand the human side, the human face of this current refugee crisis. I think the children of Syria are really the human face of this crisis. Ilan Kurdi's picture, of course, uh, shook us all to our core and made us realize that we need to take more action and be more quick. It's the worst humanitarian crisis since World War II. And Canada has played a role in the past and we're all so proud of it, but we can play that role again in a significant way today. So what are you seeing happen? I mean, Lifeline Syria has had some amazing uh, pickup mm -hmm. from all of us in the media. What, what, what are you optimistic that, that this is changing for Canadians? I am, uh, because I have seen the outpouring of support, generosity and compassion by the Canadian public. They're really uh, moving the dial um, on this crisis and they wanna play a role and they're asking the government to allow them to play a much bigger role. They need the support of the government to do that. Okay, Ron, now let's talk about that support. What can the government do? Well, <clears throat> I think they can look to, to the past and say, what have faith-based groups done in the past in terms of sponsorships? They were the leaders in 1979, 1980. They were out in front, and it didn't matter which religion, the synagogues, the Roman Catholic Church, the Mennonites, they were all there leading the sponsorship operation. To replicate that situation now, I think, is something that can be done and, uh, in our community. And I think I also have to mention provincial and municipal governments. I, I think it's significant that the mayors of our major cities, Vancouver, Calgary, Edmonton, Toronto, Montreal, have taken leadership roles personally, and provincial premiers in those provinces have taken a particular role. That's probably even stronger now uh, than it was in 1979, because then there was, today, there's a, a more reluctant federal government, which had to be sort of pushed screaming and kicking into okay. providing support. And the reluctance is because of the security concerns. Is, is, that's, you, you, primarily the, that's primarily the concern, okay, yes. You teach security law. Yes. Are these concerns valid? I think they're, uh, I think they, would suggest there should be caution. I think we still have to security clear the refugees. Uh, we have to be concerned about the usual tests in Im any immigration situation of, of health, criminality, and security issues. Uh, getting our immigration officers and security officials out into the region in near Lebanon and Turkey and 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 and. Uh, uh, Jordan, I think, is very important, getting them into the embassy so they can then go into the camps uh, where we're going to be taking a lot of our refugees. So we need more Canadian staff on the ground well, in the, the refugee Well, the government lately came, September 19th, made a commitment uh, to get more immigration visa officers out there, and by implication, there will be more CSIS and RCMP people assigned to the projects in the field. And, Lena, what is the frustration you experience then on the ground at, at the Canadian end, if you've got mm -hmm. more than enough people wanting to sponsor, you have people who step forward with money. Mm -hmm. So are ordinary Canadians just saying, get those kids into a warm mm -hmm. home. Yeah. What's the frustration you experience? The frustration is with, with the security argument. You know, our system is well equipped to deal with these security concerns. Every immigrant and refugee is screened before they come into Canada. And there's no proof or evidence that um, that really supports that these refugees will be a danger or a threat. It's actually the opposite. Refugees and immigrants tend to do better than the local population um, once they're here. They have that survival instinct. They have that persistence. And one of the little publicized figures is that half the people in the camps are children. Mm -hmm. And 25% are women. Mm -hmm. Some security threat. Yeah. We had our Molly Thomas in the camps. Mm -hmm. And, um, and Molly did bring us those stories of, of kids who don't have education and you just mm -hmm. look at these faces she interacted with and you go, how can they not um, have a future when there's so much potential in their, in their hopes and dreams? That's what you work with, education. Yeah. Tell us about how this can get released, educational opportunities. Well, you know, a lost generation is being created and 
many uh, Syrians that we talked to, many youth, were cut off from their education and they really saw it as their lifeline for a better future for their families. They suddenly are you know, cut off from uh, their, their parents losing uh, work. Um, and it's, it's really the best investment we can make for the future of Syria. It's these youth that are going to be rebuilding the country. So, Ron, we have a new government. And if you could write the script for what it would sound like as we make the challenge for this refugee crisis, what would it, what would it sound like? Well, the, I think the public now, after the, because the election is over, I think they would step up and say, and they would expect whether 50,000, 60,000, maybe even higher. But let's shame the United States into taking even more because they can. These are massive numbers to us. 50, 60, 70,000. Listen, we did 60,000 in a year and a half in 1979-80. 60,000, think about that. And the other issue that hasn't been mentioned is transportation, getting these people here. We leased planes, 747s. We had them sitting on the tarmac in Hong Kong and, and, and in, in Thailand and Malaysia. And they were not to come back unless every seat was filled with the refugees. So the immigration officers worked overtime. Somebody needs to lead and inspire to do that sort of thing to get these folks here. Well, Ron Aki, former immigration minister under Joe Clark and security law expert, and Lean El Zyback from um, Lifeline Syria. Thank you both very much. Thank you so much. Great pleasure. Coming up, how Context TV is connecting you, our audience at home, with refugee sponsorship and what to expect when you get involved with that. That's next. Canada is known worldwide for being a compassionate country that welcomes refugees. But where does that instinct come from for so many people? Our next two guests have first-hand insight into that question. Let's welcome Samia Tikal and Joanne Beach to Context. <laughs> Wonderful to have you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Hi, Joanne. Good to have you here. Wow. Uh, Samia, this topic is very personal for you. Just tell us why. Definitely. Um, so this topic uh, hits very close to home for me. My parents uh, fled uh, the Horn of Africa fleeing conflict just over 30, uh, three decades ago and arrived in Canada. And I see it every day at Matthew House now where I have the privilege of working um, as a refugee coordinator there. Um, when people, when their feet hit Canada, there's a whole new host of um, challenges resettling um, that that they have to go through. So even, for example, something my dad was lucky enough to be able to speak English when he arrived, but so many of the refugees that, that we receive at Matthew House, for example, don't even speak English. So enrolling in ESL classes, opening a bank account, just navigating the TTC system, for example, can be very daunting tasks for a lot of the people that we receive at Matthew House. So the sponsorship arm, and Joanne Breach, I want to bring you in here because as um, you know, our previous guest just made very clear, the current number of refugees we have, they are required to be sponsored. And so what we need to know is we need to be a committee to respond, right? There needs to be at least five of us uh, that, yes. that, that say together, you know, so, so we've got our Context TV number up that connects our viewers directly to you. The email is the best way is to start with this initial email, say, we are a group that is interested. You have to have five of you. Well, there, there's different forms of sponsorship. One is a group of five. One is a community uh, sponsorship, like an organization that exists in a community. So th those are separate than sponsoring in the private sponsorship program, which is underneath a sponsorship agreement holder. Yeah. And the dollar value, we should be prepared to They give estimate up. about $20, $28,000 per family of four to help resettle for a one-year commitment. If I can just sure. add yeah. something, I know refugee sponsorship is a viable option for many people, but for those of us who are just thinking, I know a lot of Canadians are asking, how can I help out? How can I get involved? And I think um, for those of us who are able to do that, that's great, but maybe some of us aren't. And sometimes it can be as simple as connecting with a place like Matthew House or connecting with agencies across Canada who are involved and serve refugees every day. Taking a new refugee out or a, new, a newly arrived immigrant in Canada out for a cup of coffee. Maybe sharing experiences with people um, about life in Canada. Maybe even just being befriending a refugee. And how about helping with employment? I think that's huge, right? Giving somebody their first Canadian job. Definitely. A lot of the refugees that we um, receive at Matthew House, some of them are highly skilled, um, highly educated, very qualified, um, but lack 
Canadian experience, which employers want to see. So even sometimes I know so many people that have um, been people, employers have been really nice enough to take people on as interns and then see that um, turn into a job prospect right. in the future. And we should know that as long as we're giving before Christmas, our federal government is matching those donations to aid agencies. We're going to turn now to a global aid um, issue here. Um, we've got Christine McMillan in the studio audience as an ambassador with the World Evangelical Alliance on Refugee Care. Christine, there's been a new initiative uh, taken for the, the world alert on this. Tell us what's happening. The World Evangelical Alliance doesn't look just at the spotlight of Europe. But when we think of 59 million refugees in our world, we are aware in the visitation of camps that there are 18-year-olds living there who were born there. We are aware in refugee camps there are young children who long to go to school. But what we're doing is encouraging support around the perimeter of those camps that are not under the spotlight where the local church in a developing country, which has very little, is going in, providing resources, providing that support. And so our eye is on Europe, but our mind and our hearts need to turn to those who are waiting and waiting for a long time. All right, so the local, the network of the local worshiping communities around those refugee crises, they need to be helped. They need to be helped. They are being very generous, but they have very little in terms of this world's goods. It's um, interesting hearing you both come at this from the faith perspective that inspires your agencies that are reaching out. And Jesus was a refugee. We don't talk about that often. His family had to flee violence. Uh, Samia, what inspires you from the story of Jesus for refugee care? It is actually definitely just that. It is, that is my mo the motivation behind why I do what I do. If we just look to the Word of God, for example, um, we're told in the Old Testament um, that we should treat the stranger like we do the native born. And I think Jesus continues that with um, in Matthew 25, 35, the motto of Matthew House is, I was a stranger and you welcomed me. Um, and what that means for me in my daily work and how I live that out, I have the opportunity and privilege to be doing that on a daily basis. Um, when people come, for example, we have four unaccompanied refugee minors staying with us at Matthew House right now. So to be able to give them school supplies and see them off to school in the morning, or, you know, the weather has temp uh, recently just dropped. So to be able to give them now, they've all come from really warm climate uh, countries. And to be able to provide them with clothing so that they're, they're good and well, well off to go, I think that's what, that's what really inspires me and that's what's important for me. Well, wow. To be the hands and feet of Jesus himself. Well, Samia Tikal and Joanne Beach, uh, both working with newcomers to Canada, changing lives and challenging us to ask, what can I do? Thank you very much. Thank you. Sheldon, over to you with a question for our audience at home. Thank you so much, Lorna. Our question for you at home is this. Do you know a refugee story that makes you glad Canada said yes? What did it take? Who went the extra mile? Send us your refugee story and we'll compile these on our website and let's learn together how to respond to the refugee crisis. You can call us at 1-800-215-4913. You can also write to us at comments at contextwithlorna.com. Join the conversation as well on Facebook and Twitter at Context TV. You connect and we'll listen. Coming up. What to weigh in the balancing security and welcome for the refugee. For many people today, the Bible is sometimes old news. But for people displaced by violence and war like those we heard about today, this is what the heart of God sounds like on page after page of the Bible. Look after orphans and widows in their distress. The stranger who dwells among you shall be to you as one born among you, and you shall love him as yourself. And that's not old news. That's good news for any who are homeless and whose world has been turned upside down. I was struck by how the refugee debate hit the headlines in Canada. The frame was security versus compassion. What if in doing good and opening our borders, we do harm and let terrorists in who don't belong Immigration policy experts like Ron Aki and others have good answers for that. 
But what is the deeper issue beneath that surface? This is where the Bible's challenge to welcome the stranger really hits home. If I'm honest, it's not always easy to love my neighbor as myself. And the command to open my eyes to protect the vulnerable stretches me to raise the bar in my life and in our country. And that's just one reason why I know that I am at least a work in progress on this, but I really wouldn't want to be anywhere else on this road. So join us here at Context. We are doing our best to try and change the landscape about information on refugee sponsorship. Look at our last episode on Raw Hope, how you can make direct donations to refugee care if you can't sponsor a family. So go to our website at contextwithlorna.com. You'll find lots there on how you can engage the great refugee crisis that needs all of our love and our compassion. And it needs our political peacemakers as well. So don't forget to pray for them. For all of us, I'm Lorna Duick. Thank you for watching. Join us next week as we explore life beyond the headlines. I'm on the set of Context with Lorna Duick, and in a couple of hours, this place will be full with our studio audience seated right here. And yes, your host, Lorna Duick, will be here. This is where it all happens. Stories like life, justice, and neighbor that you just didn't hear on the Canadian election trail this year. With a team of MPs and experts, we're looking at what's really at stake in election 2015. Stories about refugees and their harrowing journeys to Canada. Well, we are witnessing the largest refugee crisis since World War II. And the focus now is on Syria. And it's all made possible because people like you give financially. That's why I'm excited to tell you that on a special upcoming episode of Context, between December 27th and January 2nd, we will be asking you to support Context financially. I'll be right here on set with Lorna Duick, Sheldon Neal, and Molly Thomas. So I'll see you at Christmas time, and I'm sure you'll agree that context is literally worth every minute.